I'm convinced, should not eat more than eight hours a day. You need to give at least 16 hours or you put your gut complete rest. Unavoidable, it's just a consequence of aging, but that's a lie. And if you're engaging in these strategies on a regular basis, you're going to prevent every, almost every single degenerative disease, like cataracts, like Alzheimer's, like diabetes, obesity, heart disease, cancer, diabetes. So, you know, this stuff works and a miracle of fasting occurs in the refeed. Body, mind, empowerment. Get stronger, faster, smarter quicker, friendlier, more helpful, more driven. Everything the body needs. Control your mind. Welcome to the Body Mind Empowerment Podcast. I'm your host, Seam Lanz, and our guest today is Dr. Joseph Mercola. Dr. Mercola is one of the pioneers in alternative and functional medicine online. His website, mercola.com, is one of the most popular health websites on the internet, and he's written several best-selling books like Fat for Fuel, Super Fuel, and the upcoming Keto Fast. Dr. Mercola, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me. Great to yeah. be here. Yeah, it's good to see you. And uh, we saw or we met at the Upgraded conference uh, mm -hmm. a few weeks ago in, in Los Angeles. So what have you up to since that time? Oh, I've been recovering. That was like the best event I was ever at in my life. It was just like 10 Christmases condensed into three days. It was amazing. Unbelievable. I met a yeah, lot of cool people like you. So yeah. and a lot, I've had dozens and dozens of great people. It, it is clearly... the probably the best event in the world for people like us. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it was really uh, phenomenal and uh, really well organized and everything kind of well was really smooth. Yeah. But, but uh, how did you get uh, involved with like alternative medicine and starting to write a blog about it? Well, that's a long story. I don't know if I want to go there, but <laughs> why don't we go to something else? Because I mean, I could talk about an hour about that, but it, eventually I got disenchanted. I didn't start out. I was a drug prescribing doctor. Uh, prescribed thousands of people antidepressants and then I saw the light through a variety of circumstances and mm. have have been uh, really focusing on natural therapies for 25 years since the mid the early 90s so 90s 25 years at least so that's a, that's a while and um, my passion is technology it has been I took my first computer class in 1968 so I was uh, an early online my website mercola.com is actually has been the most visited natural health site in the world for the last 15 years yes. but uh my website existed before google two years well, before google that's good so yeah i was an, I was an early adopter mm, that's good yeah like uh i think uh you you do expose a lot of kind of misconceptions and uh controversies about different health topics and mm -hmm. uh, lately you've been talking a lot about like 5g and emfs so uh, can you like give a brief overview of how do, th how do those things affect our health? Yeah, well, it's a real important uh, element. It's my next book that comes out uh, in the spring of 2020. Uh, I'm just about finished with it. I'm in the fine tuning phase now, so I've, it's really fresh in my mind. But the, the central uh, concept and idea is that we're exposed to these frequencies uh, and they tend to cause oxidative stress and damage in our body. So this much, very, very similar to exposure to x-ray radiation. Hmm. Different mechanism, but not that different. Fundamentally, they're pretty similar, and that is not what the wireless industry and almost all the public health authorities and federal regulatory agencies want you to believe because they have been essentially um, captured agencies through the wireless industry. And you're just not being told the truth or we're not being as a, as a culture. So uh, the damage it causes is almost virtually identical to X-ray or ionizing radiation, even though it is non-ionizing radiation. There's not enough energy in that those frequencies to break covalent bonds and DNA directly. They do it indirectly through creating severe oxidative stress through a, a mechanism of actions that essentially catalyzes the production of peroxynitrate the hidden free nitrogen species that virtually no one knows and probably understands that then catalyzes or creates the formation of carbonate free radicals, which just is every bit as dangerous as hydroxyl free radicals. And that causes the same damage to their cell membranes, your proteins, enzymes, stem cells, mitochondria, and your DNA. Mm. Yeah. Like as I understand it, there's, there is already like quite a lot of decent research showing that 5G is, you know, linked to very, like, ex excess oxidative stress, more inflammation, and even, like, cancer well, and those sort of things. Well, there's, there's, I'd like to correct that, because there really isn't a lot of research on 5G, and that's primarily because it's not been deployed yet, and right. you have to have almost uh, research-grade equipment to generate those frequencies. So there's virtually no research on 5G, and that is really the big 
dilemma is that this is a, a, an, 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 ex, an untested experiment. There is, are no safety studies, zero, absolutely mm -hmm. zero safety studies on this. But there are, you are correct in that there are over 20,000, nearly 30,000 studies showing, going, dating back to the 50s and 60s, showing the damage from exposure to this non-ionizing radiation. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. But uh, how can people, you know, protect themselves against 5G? Like, it's, it's, I think it's quite inevitable that it will happen, but how can people well, protect themselves? There's almost, there's very little way to protect yourself when you go outside your home cocoon. And, and 5G isn't deployed formally, only it's in, in test market. So it's, rel it won't be deployed fully for a few years, but when it is, the entire planet, will be saturated with these frequencies, not just your local neighborhood or community or city or road, because they're, they're beaming it down from space. They're gonna have thousands and thousands of satellites, unlike 4G. So, and not only what does it affect us, but it affects all plant life and animal life and insects and birds. So we are looking at a, a really a prescription for environmental catastrophe and you know, it, it's just, I, I, I'm not sure what the solution is other than the, there are things you can do internally, like increase your magnesium because magnesium is a calcium channel blocker and that's the mechanism of how these things work. And uh, you can definitely spend your time at your home and your office in EMF shielded environments. And it's relatively e easy to shield from 5G and these other frequencies. You can use measuring devices that are inexpensive to, to, to determine if your shielding is effective. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's not hard. It's just hard to be outside because they're going to be pervasive. They're everywhere, everywhere. You're going to any public space, you're going to be bombarded with these frequencies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what about uh, kind of strengthening your own body's antioxidant system and like defense system? Yeah, well? yeah. There's no question that is useful. Uh, and the, the type of strategies that you're promoting and, you know, I'm really uh, amazed to meet you. I was, <laughs> we were at the Quicksilver booth and, we were talking about their new, uh, uh, I think it was autophagy activator, which I was highly, still uh, was and still am highly skeptical because I don't think Chris Shade understands autophagy like you and I do. But uh, smart guy, I love Chris, he's a good friend, you know, but uh, I still question that supplement. But anyway, it was, I was really impressed with your knowledge of autophagy and then realized you had written this book, which I'm gonna read after I finish my, the book by David Sinclair that's coming out in a few months mm -hmm. on life, ex, life extension. He's the guy that uh, discovered resveratrol. Nice. Out of Harvard. And um, so that was a tangent. Uh, the initial thought was, what can you do to stay healthy? So basically living a lifestyle like you, you and I promote, which is, you know, having these regular cycles of eating and not eating, feast and famine, and really activating autophagy on a regular basis, because autophagy activation will radically improve through hormetic mechanisms, primarily through NRF2, but many other pathways, an increase in the production of hormetic antioxidant hmm. defense mechanisms, uh, basically through uh, stimulating the antioxidant response elements genes or, or turning them on, switching them on in your DNA, so that you don't, it's, it's so much better. It's orders and orders of magnitude better than swallowing antioxidants, I mean, hmm. which is really a foolish strategy that's been disproven. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I take a few, like some tocotrienols in small doses, maybe, maybe 100 milligrams of vitamin C divided equally throughout the day. But I take very few antioxidants, I, but I take a lot of things to stimulate antioxidants yeah. in my own body. And I think that's a far wiser strategy because your body knows best. Yeah. You now, when you try to indiscriminately suppress free radicals, which can be highly beneficial, you run into problems. So, you know, it, and I think just the fact that you're, you know, the key thing is sleeping at night in an EMF free environment. Uh, as best you can, because that's when the repair mechanisms will, will occur. Mm. And, uh, and then strategies to increase NAD, because NAD um, is uh, really the fuel for an enzyme called PARP, which is short for poly ADP ribose polymerase. And that's the enzyme that repairs the DNA damage, which is probably one of the most serious threats from the, the EMF exposures. And uh, this PARP is a really intriguing enzyme. It's the, pri the primary consumer, I'm sure most of your listeners or viewers know that it's the primary consumer of NAD+. Mm. And it does it because it, NAD 
has ADP within the molecule. Many people don't know that, but it does. So a subset of, of NAD plus is ADP. It's embedded right in the molecule. And what PARP will do is it'll suck out that ADP molecule from about 150 NAD plus molecules and create this polymer matrix that facilitates DNA repair enzymes to come in and repair that DNA break, either the single or double stranded break. Mm -hmm. So if you have a lot of those breaks, your, your NAD levels are going to plummet, which is just a prescription for metabolic catastrophe. So mm -hmm. implementing strategies to augment NAD, which you can do with fa fasting, as you know, very well know, will act, increase NAD levels by 30%. I just was reading it. Sinclair's, I didn't know the mechanism, but Sinclair was talking about in his book, or talks about in his book, and, and it's actually by increasing AM, the rate-limited enzyme for the salvage pathway of NAD, which is NAMPT. Mm. So it increases. I, I was wondering how it does. I mean, it's pretty well documented. It increases levels by 30% when you fast, but the mechanism is the salvage pathway, which makes perfect sense. Right, right. Yeah. It is quite fascinating that you, you necessarily don't want to like, avoid all oxidative stress and avoid all free radicals because no. your, your body actually thrives on it through the, through the mechanism of hormesis. And fasting yeah. is one of the best ways of you know, triggering hormesis as well. And I would imagine like, you know, exercise and saunas and cold and those sorts of things also like promote NAD and oh, uh, I got to talk to you about this because I don't think I did not share that it's my maybe I did. I don't know. It was because I gave two presentations at both. I don't know if you were both. But the um, do you do you talk about heat shock proteins at all? Uh, yeah, I do. I do cover them. Yeah. OK, so what is what does a heat shock protein do? Uh, it uh, stimulates also like these antioxidant pathways and uh, causes hormetic stress. That's, that's like okay. my, my uh, simpler your, understanding. Your, your take on it. Well, that's what I thought too. And said, because you know, you hear all these benefits of heat shock proteins and it's when people talk about them, they just talk about them. Like everyone knows what the heck they do. Well, I'm not that smart to know what they do. So I had to look it up and I did a pretty deep dive on heat shock proteins and PubMed. And it turns out, that 30% of the proteins that your body makes, 30, that's almost one third of your proteins. The moment they're made, they're misfolded. Mm -hmm. And you know misfolded proteins are not a good thing. So the mechanism that your body has evolved to correct for that misfolding are heat shock proteins, mm -hmm. which is why they're so powerful. That's its primary benefit. But it, and you would be intrigued with this because heat shock foldings are actually a subset of autophagy. They're, mm -hmm. they're like cousin strategies. Mm -hmm. Because what happens when the, when they, when the foldings, pro, the proteins are so misfolded they can't be refolded correctly so they're essentially damaged beyond repair then what happens is these heat shock proteins facilitate the ubiquinization or the adding of ubiquitin molecules to that protein and it activates what's called the ups or the ubiquitin protease proteasome system and that really targets the destruction just like autophagy so they're, they're parallel pathways Mm. And it, it really is so intriguing. And I never got that. And so the big, lots of things stimulate heat shock proteins, but probably the, one of the biggest ones is heat, you know, which mm -hmm. is why I'm such a big fan of sauna. Near infrared sauna, not far infrared, but near infrared sauna. Big difference. Mm. Right. You get PBM biomodulation with the near and you don't get it with the far. Mm. Yeah, it, <laughs> yeah, the body has kind of developed all these different mechanisms to, you know, protect itself against all these environmental stressors. And it's kind of interesting to see how about, uh, you know, as we move closer to the modern world where we're exposed to like more of these non-natural stressors, like in the example of EMFs and such, how our body is going to potentially maybe adapt and uh, how is our physiology going to change? It's, it would be interesting to see, like, like I said, it's an <laughs> untested experiment that... Oh, yes. There's no question. So, uh, yeah, what, so uh, that's pretty good. Any other question about EMF? And the, otherwise, we can go to my new book, which I think is kind of fun. It comes out next yeah. week, actually. Yeah, so I think we can yeah, carry on with uh, the Keto Fast book because we mentioned fasting already. So I think people are yeah. more interested in that. So it's, it's one of the strategies you can use to help repair some of the damage from, from uh, EMF exposures. So the, there's a lot of confusion about this though and the first step before you consider fasting because there's no question fasting is a powerful strategy and it's been used universally since as far as recorded history and almost every major religion in, in incorporates that as part of a spiritual practice so that's kind of a clue that there's probably some good health benefits to it <laughs> so the, the, que the question because I was I was so intrigued and fascinated with it that I was going, I wrote keto fast initially. The intention was to 
<clears throat> guide people through how to do a five-day water fast and the reasons why that was so useful. But when I started digging into the literature, I realized that that's probably not a good strategy mm. because it's the 21st century. And as a result of that, we need a modification because <clears throat> we're exposed to about 80,000 toxins mostly fat soluble and they're stored in our fat cells and they're liberated when we start burning fat, which happens when you're water fasting right. over a long term. And since you're not having any food sources, you're having to rely on stored nutrients and proteins to really uh, fuel the detox system to modify uh, the toxins properly so that your body can excrete them. And it's not done very efficiently at the levels of exposure that the 21st century leads us to. So it probably worked great, even in the 20th century, certainly the 19th and before then, because the amount of exposure to these chemicals were pretty limited, except in rare industrial uh, scenarios, industrial contaminations and such. But uh, now just about everyone has massive exposures. I mean, it's just unavoidable. It's almost like the EMF. I, I mean, you'd have to be a pretty much of a, a hermit living in, in the <laughs> wilderness somewhere to, to have that type of exposure. So... Uh, you can basically, it's safe to assume that you're, you're loaded with them. And as a result of that, uh, I think multiple day water fasting, although metabolically clearly provides enormous benefit, isn't the best strategy. And, and additionally, it's hard to do. I mean, you and I are pretty motivated and we could do just about anything. But for most people, it's going to be a small minority of people who have that willpower and self-discipline to, to mm -hmm. initiate a program like that. So the compliance is low. But then, you know, it doesn't work as well. And then here's the other third issue why it's not as good is that you can't do it as frequently. Mm. You cannot do a five-day water fast every month if you weigh right. what you and I do. It, it will make you worse. I'm convinced it will. Now, for some people who have a 50, 100, 200 pounds to lose, they need to do it once a month or more. But that's not us. So right. for the, the, the healthy, it's, it's a different strategy, which is why I came so up with How does it look fast. like, how does the keto fast kind of look like our different well, it's, you know, uh, basically starts with intermittent fasting. Uh, you, you know, you restrict and compress your eating window to at least eight hours. And I, as I was doing another podcast, I realized, actually, I, I, it wasn't podcast. It was my own question and answer session that I was uh, doing uh, to questions of people out on my site. I realized that you sleep for eight hours, right? That's a no-brainer. I mean, unless you're like really foolish or ignorant, you know, that's the basic human need is about eight hours. Might be 7.30, might be 8.30. And of course it varies depending on your circumstances, but essentially you've got to give your body the opportunity to sleep that long. If you don't, you're going to get damaged. Well, similarly, the converse of that, if you, you really shouldn't, I'm convinced, should not eat more than eight hours a day. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you, you, you need to give at least 16 hours or you put your gut complete rest. Now, I like to extend a little bit better, longer, like maybe 18 hours. And that might be wrong. You know, I don't know. It's, it, but it's somewhere between 16 and 18 hours. I don't think you need to go longer than six hours. So some people yeah. eat in a four-hour window, some in a two. I think it's a little bit extreme, especially if you do it every day, which is what I advocate. I recommend doing mm -hmm. this every day. I, I don't think there's – and I could be wrong in this, but I don't think I am. I, I think this is the strategy that we're designed to eat. Mm -hmm. uh, and especially, and you'll appreciate this, especially before you go to bed. Yeah. I just learned this because I've been devouring these PubMed articles on uh, NAD and its cousin, NADPH, mm. which is every bit as important as NAD. Every bit. The battery of your cell, the store, the, the, it stores the reductive potential to recharge your antioxidants once they donate their electron to neutralize a free radical. So what happens is that NADPH, you know what the biggest consumer of NADPH in your body? Like PARP is the biggest consumer of NAD plus. NADPH, what is the biggest consumer of that? Uh, maybe ATP nope. or something. Nope. There's all, actually, Tyler, there was only one guy I've ever asked that answered it correctly, and it was, it was Tyler LeBaron, <laughs> the molecular hydrogen guy, who's, who's just a brilliant guy. But, any, but he's a biochemist. So it actually is the creation of fat, fatty acid creation. Wow. So he said, well, what does that have to do with anything? It has a lot especially with sleeping and your timing for sleeping. Because if you are eating calories bef right before you go to bed, normally, you know, the best time to eat the most food is when you're going to use it. Like you're going to go out and do some hard farm work or do a heavy workout. Well, it's a little bit different for a workout because we, I mean, we can talk about that too, about timing your IGF and everything. Uh, but the, 
normally if you're going to do a lot of hard labor, you want to have fuel on board. But if you're going to eat right before you go to bed, you're sleeping. That's, you're not, you're, you, that's the least amount of time you're, or the time you're using the least amount of calories. So <clears throat> what are you going to do with those calories? Well, not only is it going to create increased oxidative stress in the electron transport chain, create more free radicals, primarily through superoxide, hydrogen peroxide generation, but also it will consume NADPH because it has to store those calories as fat. As a result, it has to create fatty acids. So your NADPH levels go way down. And your ability to recharge your antioxidants and repair the damage, the cellular damage during the nighttime is radically reduced. Hmm. So that's the best explanation. And I actually figured that out myself. Now, maybe some other people figured it out, but if they have, I haven't read it or heard anyone say that before. As far as I know, I'm the first one to identify that as the reason why you shouldn't eat three to four hours before you go to sleep. Wow. So it's pro and there and it may be there are probably other reasons, but to me that's probably one of the most profound molecular biological justification for that strategy. Right. Yeah, yeah, I do remember you mentioned that that the bulletproof conference, and I I didn't know about it like that specific mechanism, uh, but uh, I would I would also suggest that you know yeah in general you 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 will feel if you eat like a bunch of food before going to bed then it's oh. going to be simply uncomfortable for your digestion and uh, you know you're going to be bloated and such so yeah it's going to interfere with the general health. And, uh, yeah, because you're going to direct I, energy to breaking down your food and your gut's not going to be at rest. So it's just a bad strategy. And it's yeah, so yeah. simple. It doesn't cost you anything. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and also like uh, the, a lot of the autophagy process also gets ac activated or processed during deep sleep, so to say. So if you interfere mm -hmm. your deep sleep, then you may, may not even get like that much autophagy compared to the amount of fasting you do. So that, that's another of those. Well, I wanted to dial. I'm probably going to interview you on my site too. But I wanted to dialogue with you. Maybe it's a good time to do it because we started a little bit discussing this a little bit. It was, is the, the frequency of autophagy because I was thinking up until, I mean, earlier this year that activating autophagy every night or every day was a good idea. And now I'm not convinced that that's the ideal strategy. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and, and by activating autophagy, I mean, not only the intermittent fasting, but taking polyphenols, which also activate autophagy, like mm -hmm. resveratrol and fisetin and berberin and curcumin and a whole variety of other strategies that you can activate autophagy with. Yeah. So, and I was doing that on a nightly basis. And I think, you know, I'm thinking this is probably not good. <laughs> yeah. And it should, I'm thinking it probably should be once or twice a week that you should do that. And I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you, because you've wrote a whole book on this, and I'm wondering what your, your thoughts are on it. Yeah, I do think that uh, a lot of people jump on the bandwagon, bandwagon of autophagy and think it's like the best thing all the time. But the truth is that you there are actually like a lot of uh, studies showing that autophagy can actually promote like tumor cell fitness and cancer cell survival. So there's always a matter of uh, well, what's the optimal dose for my specific lifestyle and my specific like training conditions and, and other, th other things. So yeah, I think uh, autophagy is a good thing, but you want to not overdo it and you definitely would benefit from like balancing it with the you know the anabolic sites and on an anabolic pathways like mTOR and those things yeah so that that's that's where that's where the you know yeah, the right. people so you, you don't think daily activation is a good idea then yeah it depends on the day like for instance if you're trying to actually if you're like on workout <laughs> days you're trying to recover then on those days i would say it's actually better to stimulate like mTOR and uh, those things because mm -hmm. you would you know promote uh, more insulin sensitivity and promote muscle growth which in turn can actually lead to like greater health span and longevity in, in an indirect mm -hmm. way. Yeah, so the, the converse of that, activating autophagy, is inhibiting autophagy. And when you inhibit autophagy, of course, you activate mTOR. And uh, let me tell you how keto fast approaches this, mm -hmm. because the, I still didn't finish your, your question, initial question, the answer to it. It went off on a tangent, but an important one. So the base... The foundational baseline strategy for keto fast is that you're intermittent fasting, restricting your eating window to, to six or eight hours. And you do that for at least a month. Most people watching your site are probably doing that. So it's not a big deal. And they can do this immediately. So mm -hmm. once you've done that, say just to simplify things, say you're eating from 9 a.m. To, to 3 p.m. That's six hours. So you do that. You've done it. So it's 3 p.m. You finish your day. You go to sleep. You wake up. It's 9 a.m. At when you, for that meal, you're going to have anywhere from three to 500 calories based on your lean body mass. One meal. Mm -hmm. And it couldn't be hot. And here's the thing. I, I, very low carbs, less than 10 grams, and relatively low fat, and mostly protein, actually. But mm -hmm. still lower, at least half the dose of protein you would normally get in a day. Right. Why protein? 
uh, because you need protein to help fuel the detox system. Mm -hmm. And the other component of the protein, though, is you, you have to be careful and you don't want to have amino acids that stimulate mTOR because you're trying to inhibit mTOR. Right. So that would be restrict, you know, really low levels of branched-chain amino acids and low levels of glutamine. Those are the primary ones that activate mTOR. Mm -hmm. So, and it's easy to do vegan proteins like chlorella or, you know, we have a vegan protein powder I use or chlorella or even bone broth, right. which has virtually no branched chain amino acids. And, it, and it's almost a perfect protein for a detox day mm -hmm. because it's going to give you primarily glycine, proline, hydroxyproline. So you do that and then you don't eat for 24 more hours. So essentially for 42 hours, you're only eating three to 500 calories. And here's the, here's the anabolic kick to it. So the next day you wake up, you know, it's been 42 hours since you've eaten. So what do you do? Do you eat right away? No. You go and do your strength training workout. Why? Because your growth hormone levels are really high. Now, your growth hormone receptors are relatively inhibited, which means that the high growth hormone levels that you have doesn't increase IGF-1. So it's, it's really intriguing. But that's when you do. You're, you, it's like you've gotten an injection of growth hormone. You go and do the, 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 your strength workout. You, you crush it. You know, and you just massively crush it and uh, you push the limit, but you do it in a fasted state and then you come back home and then you feast. Then you have yeah. your branch chains and <laughs> you, know, you know everything else and uh, lots of carbs, healthy carbs, your fruit, and you feast essentially for that one day. And, you know, that's when you're hitting the anabolic uh, pathways and, you know, fully maximizing uh, growth hormone. I do it twice a week. I guess someone like you who's younger and healthier could probably do it three times a week. But then, but then if you're doing it three times a week, you're not doing the partial fast. Then partial fasting three times a week might be a bit too much. And here's the danger of it, for, for, at least for me. Every time I do a partial fast, I will lose like four pounds. Mm, wow. Which, you know, so I've got to build up. And, I, and it, like when I'm traveling, it's just hard because I usually almost always partial fast when I travel because the other thing that it does is that when you partial fast, your ketones, ketones, ketones will go up quite dramatically and, and high ketones are a very protective reflex against ionizing radiation. So when you travel at 35,000 feet, um, which would be like 10 kilometers, I guess, for mm -hmm. your European audience, uh, the, um, the difference is that you're going to have this ionizing radiation exposure so that you're going to cause some DNA damage, and the ketones will help repair that for a variety of mechanisms, mechanisms uh, primarily through activating the NRF2 and uh, increasing NADPH levels, which is pretty interesting. It actually increases NADPH quite dramatically right. when you're fasting. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and NAD, of course. So, mm -hmm. it, it's just a good thing to do when you're traveling. If you're, if you value your DNA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I always uh, when I'm traveling, uh, then I'm always yeah fasting and uh, keeping keeping myself. It also helps with the circadian rhythms. Once you're gonna land on the new time zone. Yes. That's another benefit that, that is right. And I'm not surprised that you are fasting because you're a pretty bright guy. How old are you anyway? Uh, I'm uh, 24. 24. Oh my gosh, that is just crazy. You're just crazy smart for 24. I wish, <laughs> I wish I had a fraction of your knowledge at 24. <laughs> well, I've had I good influence. I was, I was stuck, stuck in the middle of the conventional paradigm. I, was, I think in 24, I just started medical school. And uh, I was fascinated with health. I was one of the only students in my class who was the only one who wanted to be a wellness doctor <laughs> everyone else wanted to treat disease. So I didn't call me Dr. Fiber back then, but you know, I, my, my understanding of health was probably far less than 10%, maybe less than 5% of what you have right now. So I wish I would have known that when I know now, boy, yeah. geez, we could help change the world even faster, but you know, you, you don't only do it at the pace you can, but yeah, you're, you, you're, you're way so far ahead of the curve. <laughs> well, I'm good to hear that. Uh, but coming back to the keto fast, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I think it's a really kind of unique way of going about it. And that's actually something somewhat different that you hear a lot of people talking about mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, um, for in your example, you say that it's actually better to have like somewhat moderate higher protein uh, mm -hmm. and from bone broth and those sort of things. So uh, that's, a, that's, that's, yeah, it's, it's true that you you will actually be able to maintain more lean muscle mass, but you're not going to overactivate the mTOR pathway with these uh, bone broth and uh, these things because yeah, yeah you coll collagen too. And you just and let me just interject that it has to be organic because uh, if it's not, glyphosate tends to be concentrated in the connective tissue so that you can get really high levels of glyphosate. And a lot most of the collagen bone broth powders are from China and mm -hmm. they're loaded with glyphosate. So right. there's a clock. Yeah. 
Yeah, for that for sure. <laughs> but uh, what do you think about like similar approaches, uh, like the fasting mimicking diet of uh, Walter Longo? I was just going to mention that, yeah, because you know, the the, the I, I I mean I'm pretty good at putting things together, but clearly it was the, the work came out of some other novel think, thinkers in this area, and certainly Walter Longo out of uh, USC is one of them, mm. and he's probably the most well published researcher in this area. Uh, enormous amount of work, just just not just fine, but providing the research basis and, and justification for this type of intervention. Mm. I, I, and uh, actually, he was one of the people that helped convince me uh, that five-day water fasting was a good idea, primarily because of the compliance issue. But then, so his approach was a five-day partial fast, which is actually more calories than I advocate. Mm. His first day is 1,000 calories, and the next four days are 700, which... You know, so it's not customized for the person, you know, because mm. 700 is different for a 100 pound woman versus a 225 pound male, you know, which is kind of odd, but that's what he's chosen to do. Mm. And, uh, you know, it's very expensive. It's his, his diet is the prolon. It's like $300 and they know half of it is supposed to go to his research, but still it's a lot of money. Yeah. So, um, I, what do you I, think about the food choices? Like, uh, as I understand if the, the prolon is like uh, somewhat higher in carbs, and very low in protein is like the opposite. Uh, yeah, I, I don't. I disagree with him, and that's you know, and I, and I haven't had a chance to dialogue and debate him on that. Uh, and there may be value for his approach, but I, but I personally, I've noticed that I think this works better for people like you and me who need to really want to focus on preserving their lean body mass and are not so much interested in activating the uh, autophagy benefits to treat chronic degenerative diseases like almost you know 95 percent of the population needs to do so when you're optimizing health phase i think that this is a better strategy but the, but the really important point here and i kind of alluded to it earlier is that you can do keto fasting twice a week right. now i don't do it twice a week unless i'm stable at home and i can keep my weight up because when i'm traveling to lose weight and i have a and i i, I encourage anyone to establish their base weight that they do not want to go below. And if you're mm. below that weight, you don't partial fast, right. which is there's four contraindications to partial fasting or keto fast, underweight, uh, eating disorder, breastfeeding, or pregnancy. So mm. you don't do this because there are times in life when you have to be anabolic <laughs> and, yeah. or you shouldn't because of psychological disorders. So, so if, you're, if you don't have the right way, you can't do it. So but keto fasting normally, if you're not traveling and doing this other you know, partial fast, and you can do it twice a week. So that's over a hundred times a year. Mm. Longo, I mean, at most you can. So say you do it once a month, which is still pretty extreme. Mm -hmm. You're going to get five times twelve. That's sixty. So that's still a lot, but you're going to still get more uh, on keto fast. And who's going to spend three hundred dollars twelve times a year? That is, that's like thirty, thirty, thirty six hundred bucks yeah. Yeah. Just for those partial fasts. And it's not that much food. So. But the other thing, though, is that most people won't do it once a month. They're going to do it once a quarter. So once you get into health, mm -hmm. so your 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 levels of autophagy are not going to be that activated. And even and even on day one, you're, if you're taking a thousand calories, it's a sort of a transition day. So you really, I don't think you're activating autophagy that much. You're getting some, and and I haven't studied his program carefully enough to know how much he's integrating the intermittent fasting in the crusty mm -hmm. window. I suspect he is, but I don't know that for sure. Yeah, I think yeah he he advises people to do the prolon fast for like once a month or so or like once yeah. every two months and the other days you don't really have like a really strict fasting regimen. So yeah, uh, yeah, which uh, I, I think is cool. it's not going to be like worth it for most people in a sense that they're not going to activate that much autophagy and uh, they don't do it that frequently either. No, because there is a benefit to having a base level of autophagy, and I mm. think it's pretty minimal when you do a, you know an eighteen hour, sixteen hour overnight fast. Yeah. But you're getting some. There's some benefits. It's sort of a basal level. And then you really want to pump it up once or twice a week to really get rid of the extra garbage. Yeah, that's for sure. And especially specifically for uh, people who are trying to maintain more lean muscle mass, uh, then, yeah, n not necessarily having to go for, like, these longer fasts every, that often is not going to be, like, the most optimal thing. And uh, no, that's no, where... No. Yeah, so I think for athletes, for someone who's competing, it makes more sense. But even if you're a really competitive athlete, you may, you know, might not be a, the greatest strategy. Although I think you, you know, certainly your training season you can when you're competing, it might be something different. But there's no question when you when you deprive your body of food on, a, on regular intervals, you're going to improve your overall health and you mm -hmm. and you'll perform, improve your athletic performance. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you, you mentioned that uh, you're not a fan of like these extended fasts anymore. 
uh, like longer than several days. So uh, would you see like any potential like uh, situation where you would uh, advise for someone to do it? Oh, sure. There, you know, there's that, that's not an absolute. That's just I'm not a fan for most people. But there are certain can, can, excuse me, cases where people are seriously metabolically damaged, like morbid obesity, where they might be mm. two, three, four hundred pounds overweight. Then it might make sense because the, what you need to do is overcome years, decades of metabolic damage, and that isn't done easily. You could do it with partial fasting, but it just take a lot longer. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and maybe that's what you the toe in the water, but you know, for those cases, and here's the other thing, when you do these extended fasts, normally you can't do many activities. I mean, you're really not supposed to work out. You're supposed to kind of hang around and, and you know, just sit around, and not do much work because you're in recovery mode essentially for a long time. And right. you know, there are clinics in North America that do this, like the true North clinic out of in California, they fasted 15, 16,000 patients for you know, five to 40 days or more. Mm -hmm. Wow. And uh, they do it in house, and they don't have them do anything. They just hang there. They don't do right. anything. They just read and maybe take a little walk, and that's it. So it's 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 impractical for most people to do to integrate into their life if you're gonna, you know, if you have mm. a busy schedule, it's not gonna work. Right, right. And most people they simply like to eat that much, <laughs> so they they still want to have something during the day. Yeah. Well, it, well, in partial fasting, you're you're not eating once or twice a week, which I think is a good strategy. And here's the cool thing. <clears throat> when you're doing it, you're still eating that one meal. So you're, it's actually, you're getting substantial calories. Three to 500 calories is a substantial calorie. So you, you get that satiated feeling. And then normally in a regular day, you would eat one or two more times you know, to, in your six hour window. So you're really only for four or five hours, you're not eating. Mm -hmm. And then you're in your regular <clears throat> scheme. So it's not, it's not like you're hardly missing anything. Right. So you're not really being deprived at all. Yeah. Uh, would you consume like any specific foods as well that uh, actually stimulate autophagy, like cruciferous vegetables yes. or uh, some berberine yes. or something? And absolutely. No, that's, that's a really great thing. So cruciferous vegetables are loaded with glucosinolates, and there's lots of different glucosinolates. The, the most famous one is glucoraphanin, which is in mm. broccoli and cat, uh, uh, cauliflower. Maybe cabbage too. No, I think cabbage is a different glucosinolate. So, and that, that glucoraphanin is converted with bimyrosinase to sulforaphane, which is a really, really valuable molecule. That man, I am just so jazzed about sulforaphane, <laughs> primarily because it's been the most studied. It probably all these glucosinolates and uh, are have similar benefits, but we, they haven't been studied like sulforaphane. But it bas basically, it activates NRF two. It it upregulates this enzyme, the rate limited enzyme for the creation of glutathione, mm. which is magnificent. Uh, so it has a lot of great benefits. And uh, it actually, you know, the other thing it does, so far fame does, you'll love this. It increases heat shock proteins. Nice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. So it's like a hormetic stressor then. Yeah, it is. But you know, here's the other thing. So when you do that, you do that when you're, are, when you're seeking to activate autophagy and then once or mm. twice a week. So I, I would take broccoli. I take broccoli sprouts. I take resveratrol, I take fisetin, uh, a lot of other polyphenols, the curcumin, um, quercetin, uh, uh, I probably, I think terostilbene. Uh, so there's a wide, I think I probably take almost 10 different polyphenols on the mm. days I'm act, trying to activate. And mm. I take them like right before I go to sleep on the, on the partial fast day. So I've got you know, like I'm coming up on 30 hours of fasting on me already, then I'll take them in the morning before I eat. So I just got another four or five hours before I, you know, eat my first food. So, you know, I'm really activating those pathways. Mm. And so it's, it's, it, it just seems to me the right frequency, you know, you punch it once or twice a week. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, it's, it's something that you would actually take during only the keto fast yes. days and you wouldn't take yes. them like on the refit days. Yeah. yeah and, and interestingly, I didn't come to this appreciation until after the draft of the book was submitted because it was an evolving process. Mm -hmm. You know, I was learning as I was going along and I kind of realized that taking these <clears throat> polyphenols every day is probably not a good strategy. And there's some people like uh, Stephen Gundry who we, we share similar principles, but he, I don't think he appreciates that fact yet, mm -hmm. that you can't be activating these pathways polyphenols all the time. And I think mm -hmm. you develop, I mean, nature is full of cycles. It's up and down, you know, it's, it's rare where you're going to take, you want to do the same thing continuously. I mean, there's some things you want to do, like you want to sleep every night, you want to drink enough water, but
but it, you know, with respect to food and supplements, you've got to be really careful. Yeah, yes, yeah, it's, it's so true that uh, I do agree that polyphenols are great, but they're also like hormetic dose, and uh, too much is definitely not good. And all the time, either is gonna simply you're gonna go into like the catabolic side for too long, and uh, like suppressing the mTOR pathway for too long as well can, can lead to some uh, insulin resistance and other ailments. So yeah, you you want to say you know respect the balance side. Yeah, so, uh, so some of the other two of the other polyphenols I forgot about actually a few, a few more would be EGCG from, from green tea. And then there's a, a, the, one of the most intriguing ones I found was from pomegranate peels, which, ha, which mm. is full of elagic acid and, and elagrotannins. And when you eat them, your microbiome converts them to urolithin A, which has profound benefits. But most people think no pomegranates are useful, but they, they're eating the fruit of the seeds and almost all the polyphenols are in the peel. Mm -hmm. So you can find stuff on Amazon where they powdered up the peel, which is very, very bitter, very similar to berberine. You know, it's almost mm. as bitter, probably even more bitter than berberine. So you want to put it in a capsule, right. but that would be good. And then um, coffee is another great polyphenol that would activate it. And uh, raw cacao would do it also, raw cacao beans or nibs mm. that are pull, pull, uh, probably have one of the highest concentrations of polyphenols in any, any food product is cacao, cacao nibs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, I do consume those things as well, uh, quite on a frequent basis. Uh, but what, yeah, what do you think about... Restricted to autophagy. Dave. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, but what do you think about, like, um, what, this, there's a lot of uh, controversy and people are discussing all the time in the world that uh, what breaks a fast, so to say, like, what do, you, what do you consider that breaks a fast? Well, this is not that hard of a question. It's calories, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Now, you can still have, I mean... So potentially the partial fast is breaking it, but it's only 500 calories. So, I mean, you could take a little bit of food and, you know, just walk a little bit and you essentially would burn it. So you're not really breaking it right. that much, but, but from a theoretical perspective, anytime you have a calorie, you know, you're impairing autophagy. So you might, mm -hmm. it might go a little bump up because you just consumed it. It goes back to where it was shortly. Yeah. But if you want to optimize this, no calories, anything that, yeah. so how do you know? Look at the label. It will tell you if there's calories <laughs> on it. Yeah, yeah, I do think that uh, autophagy itself, you know, it, it doesn't work like an on and off switch that if you take like a cup of green tea or something, then the one, one to two calories is going to immediately stop autophagy yeah. and you won't no, get into no. like for the next day, it's, it's, yeah. it's like really it gradual. It might be a little nick and if you're in a multiple day fast, a green tea is not going to do a darn, darn thing for it. it won't, you won't even notice it. Yeah, you know, that's for sure. One or two calories. You need probably at least 50 to 100 calories before you're going to have a, a, a significant dent. Mm. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, and and it, depends, it depends on the calories too, because if you're eating branched chain amino acids, it's, you know, 50 yeah. calories of those is going to be a lot different than taking, you know, some polyphenols. Yeah, that's true. Like if, drinking some Gatorade or something is going to or, or have yeah, like a yeah. much bigger interfering effect. Yeah, you're going to, you're going to, insulin is going to go up and boom, you're going to put the brakes on uh, autophagy. Yeah. Because that info will be activated. Yeah. Uh, so you, you do mention that you eat like carbs as well. So uh, oh, maybe, yes. maybe break down like what's, what's your like refeed day look like then? Uh, I have a lot of fruit. I, I live on a property. I just purchased an acre next to me and it's converted it to a regenerative agriculture farm. So I've got like nice. a lot of blueberries right now. We're harvesting blueberries. I'm, I'm harvesting about a gallon of blueberries a day. <laughs> wow. uh, and I've got mangoes coming up in a few weeks. We've got plums, Japanese plums, cherries, apricots, uh, avocados. So avocado is obviously not a carb, but so I'll have those healthy fruits and mm. citrus like tangerines. So I'll have those. And then I, I I'm a real big fan of yams, um, sweet potatoes. So I try to have maybe three, you know, come over half a pound, a half pound, three quarters of a pound of, of those on those days, like two medium to large ones. Mm -hmm. And I just love those. I cook them up. I put them in a steam convection oven. It's nice and soft. I've got some raw butter on there. It's some good, good healthy salt and you know I feast on that so uh, and I actually even have those on days that I'm not activating or activating seeking to activate them tour specifically mm -hmm. on, on my on my post my post workout days I'll have specifically high foods high in concentrations of branch chains like a whey protein concentrate which is one of the highest densities of branch chains food right. food sources so I'll have, I'll have those days, I'll have that. I don't eat that, that on, any, on the on other days, but I will have a bit of glutamine and uh, I'll have those carbs. So I think it's healthy. Mm -hmm. I, I like the carbs, but you know, on the partial fast days, once or twice a week, I'm not eating any of that stuff. Yeah, that's true. So you're not afraid of like protein and you're not afraid of carbs for longevity either then? 
No, no. I, I probably have over 100 grams of protein a day. And I was protein phobic for a long time up until probably late last year. And then I started because I was, you know, uh, Ron Rosedale, I'm sure you've encountered before, mm. kind of was a mentor for a long time and a lot of various he exposed me to the insulin, made me help, help me understand initially in 1995, gosh, 25 years ago that uh, insulin was dangerous and believe me no one back then knew that so you know he really catalyzed my journey along along the nutritional landscape and then he had me believe that excess protein was damaging because of the mTOR and when he introduced it it was a foreign concept to me so i just believed him because he was mm. a pretty smart guy but then i started researching it and and, and uh i i don't agree with him i i think it's this you need the cyclical component to it yeah. So I, I'm not afraid of, of protein. As I said, on the keto fast days, I will have maybe 40, probably less than 50, probably maybe 45 grams of protein. But in the other days, I'm over, typically over 100. But that's not, a, you know, that's not high branch change. A lot of 30 grams of that is, uh, is uh, collagen protein, so, which does very little to activate uh, anabolism mm -hmm. uh, or mTOR. So you know, it's kind of like a safe protein. You, could, you can get away with a lot of that, the, those guys. And collagen, you know, most everyone watching this is deficient in these, these, uh, these specific amino acids because we're not eating head to toe mm. or tail to toe, which is uh, uh, the connective tissue primarily, but also the organs. Mm -hmm. So the connective tissue is loaded with the, these, these amino acids, proline, hydroxyproline, and, and glycine. And I love glycine. I think that's a, that's something most people should be taking uh, for a lot of reasons. Glycine will increase any DPH, mm, right. uh, but it also helps protect against the damage from glyphosate, which is you know, a universal exposure. Uh, and uh, it's a precursor for glutathione. It's not the rate limiting one, but if you don't have enough glycine, you won't make enough glutathione. And gluta, I mean, glut glutathione is the bomb. You've got to have glutathione. So anything you could do to increase your glutathione production, not swallowing it exogenously or taking some glutathione supplement, I would mm. never, I mean, never, but I don't think hardly anyone's going to need to take external glutathione. You just increase your own production of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's why I like fasting is the ultimate detox, so to say. Yeah. <laughs> Well, if you're the, doing it the right way, if you're doing it yeah, the right way. That's for yeah. sure. Yeah. I, I also agree, yeah, that uh, the activation of mTOR isn't bad in the context of doing these cyclical fasting and such. You, you would benefit from activating mTOR, but you, you have to make sure that you're going to go into the catabolic side and you actually fast as well. Because imagine that doing the high, high protein bodybuilding diet, you know, six times a day and switch stimulating protein <laughs> mTOR that way, that's definitely not like the best way of going about no. it and i'm afraid like most people simply adopt this very extreme viewpoint of either either all in or nothing at all so <laughs> yeah you're right absolutely and you're you're a pretty wise guy to figure this out at such an early age but you're absolutely correct is that is this cycling in and out that is the key it's the key one of the keys to life is just not doing things continuously you know <laughs> yeah. there's phases of life and interestingly you know, it's, it's, it doesn't really relate to the keto fast, but it's a good example of what nature's evolved to do. And we've got it's, it's hibernation where bears and, and whales, they don't necessarily formally hibernate, but they will not eat for six months or more wow. uh, you know, where they're traveling to their breeding grounds or feeding grounds. And uh, it's extraordinary that they've developed the physiology to allow them to do it. And it's primarily the ability to burn fat as their fuel. They're not eating mm. anything. Yeah. So powerful method. Yeah, ketosis is powerful. <laughs> yeah. uh, but do you have like any final tips or something that we didn't cover in relation to like keto fast and uh, fasting? Hmm, it's a good question. Um, well, just to understand that you know there is great value in doing this as a regular discipline, and the the uh, you, you'll get enormous benefit. And if you want to live, if one of your goals in life, and I suspect most of the people on your channel are are optimized for the strategy is to live healthy to 100 to have all the function that you do at your age of 24 and flexibility and mobility and no frailty high bone density and 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 really a key, high functioning of your your uh, nervous system and your brain then you want to do these things regularly it, mm -hmm. you know it's interesting uh you can live you know cataracts are the most common surgery in the world is cataracts and it's usually due to oxidative stress in the lens of your eye. Mm -hmm. And I just interviewed uh, Chris Kenobi, who is an ophthalmologist, actually retired ophthalmologist because he decided to stop his practice and just research his thing. He's kind of like the 21st century Weston Price guy. 
And he was telling me that he's only seen two people in his life that were over 90 hit that had crystal clear lenses. So it, it is possible, you know, typically we, uh, in, uh, we used to think that cataract development or the darkening and the opaqueness in the eye that re, in your lens that requires a, typically a transplant or a, a, an implant um, is uh, unavoidable. It's just a consequence of aging, but that's a lie. And if you're engaging in these strategies on a regular basis, you're going to prevent every, almost every single degenerative disease, like mm -hmm. cataracts, like Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. like diabetes, obesity, heart disease, cancer, diabetes. So, you know, this stuff works. And, you know, if you want to live long, I, I wrote my first book, Fat for Fuel. This next, Keto Fast comes out April 30th. Uh, and then my EMF book comes out next spring. So to me, that's the trilogy. Now, that's not the... Uh, of, of, steps that you want to implement into your life if you want to live to be 100 and then reap the benefits that will be available when technology through its exponential advancement has the tools and resources to provide us with the next steps. But you're not going to make it unless you've really integrated these, uh, these challenges. And, it, and it, the import, it is so cru crucially important because the odds are being stacked against you more and more every day. And as we mentioned earlier, you know, you've got these 5G satellites that are being coming up. You are going to be essentially bathed every time you go outside with this uh, potent oxidative stress inducer. And, and every, you know, almost all the food being produced in every restaurant is processed food that's designed to get you unhealthy. It, mm -hmm. There's no other way. I mean, you've got to make your own food or have someone you know prepare it for you because otherwise you're going to get unhealthy. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, these are the strategies you need to do if you want to live long and healthy and not suffer. And although it may take some time, effort, and energy and resources to implement, I mean, it's going to, you'll reap the benefits by, by not being down, by not being sick, by not coming down with diseases or challenge health complications that, that are going to lay you up and cause you needless pain and suffering. Hmm. So that, that's my, that's my pitch for the, for the program. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's quite amazing. And uh, it's, you have to kind of, yeah, like you said, the prevention is, is the best medicine. And uh, it starts with yeah, taking care of the fundamentals and yes. following this sort of a cyclic, cyclical manner in uh, your health and nutrition. Yeah, because uh, your body was designed to stay healthy. It wants to be healthy. I mean, every, me and once you start to study this at a deep level, as you, I'm sure you do when you're reading PubMed, you realize it's just an amazing miracle of all the designs that we have to keep us healthy. And it's just shocking that people can still retain a fraction of their health with what they're doing to sabotage. Yeah. <laughs> not, not typically intentionally, but nevertheless, they're still doing it. Yeah. But if, if, you, if you understand it and implement the programs that I recommend and you're advocating, I mean, your body will self-repair and you will stay healthy. And it'll, it's a good thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Keto Fast is coming out April 30th. And yeah. uh, where, where can people get it? Uh, they can get it pretty much any place that you buy books. It should be. My last book, Fat for Fuel, was the number one book and sold in the United States by uh, Nielsen Ratings. Nice, so, nice. Uh, yeah, even, even the fiction books, too. So I'm hoping that we'll, we'll reach that level. It was the first time I've ever done it with any book, but uh, Keto Fast may or may not reach that level, but it should be pretty good, and it's available anywhere. You know, mm. Amazon is a typical strategy, but there's any place that, book that, that nice. sells books should have it. Nice, looking forward to it. And uh, before and I ask the last question, we have a website, ketofast.com, where there's some other bonuses that you can get to by going there. Okay. We'll put all the links in the show notes. And uh, where can people learn more about you and your work? Yeah, it's mercola.com, M-E-R-C-O-L-A.com. Mm -hmm. And we've been around since before Google, so it's 22, 23 years now. Nice. And the, it used to be that you could just use Google to type in a health question, and pretty much you would be guaranteed that one of our pages would be in the top two or three articles, but Google has uh, designated us as fake news now. So oh. you won't find our articles on Google. <laughs> so I would strongly encourage you if you found what I mentioned interesting or intriguing to sign up for our newsletter, it's free and you'll get a direct line. You can go also go to our website at Mercola.com and we do have a search engine that you can access all those articles. So it's interesting. Like people will write and ask me, friends will ask me, write, write and ask me questions. And you know, he's hard to remember everything. So like one friend this morning asked me, his daughter had a UTI, was doing cram, cranberries and mannose. Is there anything else I can do? So I pulled it up. You know, I, I just wrote the question on my website and it reminded me, oh, I forgot. Chicken <laughs> is the number one reason why people get UTIs. Don't eat chicken. There's a lot of reasons for it because you know, when you bring it in, if, unless you 
bringing in cooked chicken, but if you bring in raw chicken, it's just loaded with bacteria. Mm -hmm. And it's impossible to keep it non-contaminated at home. So right. simple things like that. You know, that's just one example. I mean, just put, think about any health condition. Yeah, if you go to our site and type it in, you'll, you'll get the answer. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Yeah, over the course of the years, you've probably gained a lot of, you know, knowledge and such. So my last, yeah. question, my last question is like, what's this one piece of advice or a habit you wish you adopted sooner that improved your body and your mind? That's a great question. I don't know that I would do one. I was ignorant of the value of sleeping. So I, I've come to appreciate that largely through Matthew Walker's work. And it's rare why I don't leave, give my body the opportunity to sleep at least eight hours, sometimes nine if I need it. So that would be one. And then, you know, I fell into the, the low fat myth in the seventies, you know, like everyone else pretty much. And so understanding the value of ketosis and then cyclical ketosis mm. has been an enormous benefit to me. I wish, I just wish I would have known that when I was younger. I mean, I just cringe. I mean, I, if I knew what I knew now, I could be as healthy as you. You know, it's, it's, you know I still have a full head of hair, I'm sure too, but, uh, the, uh, you know, you do what you can when you do it. But uh, so those are probably the big ones. And exercise. I was placing too much emphasis on cardiovascular exercise. And when I first met you at Bulletproof, uh, I didn't realize how fit you were. And I started watching some of your videos. And it's very impressive what you can physically do with these. Like, I think you're doing one, you know, uh, upside down or not. Uh, push-ups, inverted push-ups. And right. you know, some other gym gymnastic skills that you're pretty gifted at. So, you know, those are, the, those are the things you want to do. Functional body movement, strength training. You don't want to do long endurance running. You mm. know, it's just, you need maybe do a little bit, but, you, you know, I did it for 45 years and I just <laughs> regret it. And it was, right. I was trying to be healthy, doing the best I could, but it was the wrong strategy. Mm. Yeah. So let's, ho let's hope that the fasting and keto fast will going to heal it now. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, we could be, you know, again, that's the, that's the key strategy to focus in on. Your body has in it with the gift of repair and regenerate. And one of the other benefits of keto fasting is to activate your stem cells, especially when you're in the, you know, you've done that strength training. So not only are you activating the mTOR, but you also have activated stem cells to do that re yeah. regenerative repair. Yeah, so, yeah that's, that's important. Yeah, you have to actually feed to uh, gain the benefits of the fasting. Yeah, as long ago as he told me this, and it was really important, it's really one of his best words of wisdom is that the miracle of fasting occurs in the refeed. Mm. It's not in the not eating, it's in the refeed. Wow, <laughs> that's a good point to end the podcast. And uh, yeah, thanks for coming to the show and uh, looking forward to your uh, Keto Fast book and the next book that you're going to write as well about EMF. Well, so. I'm looking forward to reading your book too. I mean, it's, 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 it's a beast of a volume and I, and I would not let you give me the hardcover book. I said, give me the electronic. <laughs> I, I didn't have like... A, room in my luggage to carry a five home book back so it was <laughs> yeah well yeah thanks thanks and uh, i'll see you around all right. all right i think in my keto fast one of my recent articles one of our commenters said hey you should interview this guy and it was you <laughs> really <laughs> yeah wow. i said i said you know i think i know that person and i looked at your i clicked on the link and looked at his he sounds and looks like someone i just met and i realized oh, it was you <laughs> <laughs> that's cool all right, that's it for this episode of the Body, Mind and Format podcast. If you want to support us, then I would greatly appreciate it if you could leave us a review on iTunes and the other social media platforms. You can now order my new book, Metabolic Autophagy, that covers a lot of the same topics that we talked in here. It's a collection of certain lifestyle habits and practices that prioritize longevity as well as performance. To support this podcast, you can also become a Patreon and get exclusive video lectures from my biohacking bootcamp that covers circadian rhythms, intermittent fasting, autophagy, resistance training, biofeedback, and many more. But other than that, my name is Seem. Stay tuned for the next episode. Stay empowered.